My name is Jim Wyrick. I'm the chief scientist for EdgeCase. We do Rails applications and some iPhone apps. Um, there's my Twitter handle if you want to follow me on Twitter. And there's an email address if you want to contact me with questions after this. This presentation is on GitHub. So there's lots of references at the end of this. So I'll probably flip through them fast by the time we get there. So if you want to see what they are, you can go to GitHub and download it. And I got lots of links and things in that. OK, I want to start off this talk with a question. How do you recognize a good design? Think about that for a second. I ask this question a lot in telephone interviews that I do with people, just to see if they can put into words what they think a good design is. And the most common response I get over the phone is, I maintain that some designs, it's easy to tell that they are not a good design. Actually, I got a lot of pictures like this, but we'll, th th this one will do for right now. Who can tell me what this is? <laughs> the George Washington Monument in Baltimore. Wrong. <laughs> but good guess. Good guess. I'll give you some hints. It's in London. Okay. Monument. It's a monument. Okay. The George Washington <laughs> Monument in London. <laughs> it's on Pudding Lane. Put, it's, it's, it's the Pudding Monument, the monument to banana pudding. No, it is not. Uh, it, ha, it uh, is a memorial for an event that happened on September 2nd, 1966. Does anybody know what happened on, excuse me, 1666? The Great Fire of London, yes. Um, a baker, supposedly a baker, left some burning coals in his stove overnight, and he was sleeping upstairs, and a spark from that caught fire, and all of Pudding Lane went up in flame. And because Pudding Lane was kind of in the poor part of town, they weren't really concerned about getting everybody there and, and getting the fire out. And because they delayed, because of political manipulations, because of all kinds of factors, that would, and, and there was a drought that year, right? This fire spread. It was terrible. It burned for, I think it was five days. It got so hot, it melted the lead off of the roofs of buildings. It, it made the bricks explode from the pressure that built up inside because of the heat. Uh, here are people escaping the fire, carrying their belongings. And another contributing factor to the fire was people were more concerned about escaping the fire than to put out the fire. Finally, some people got together. They started pulling down the buildings. They made a fire break, and they were able to get it under control, but not before it burned down a good part of London in that day. You can see the London Wall there in black, and a, you know, three-fifths, four-fifths of the city was absolutely terribly burned down because of that. You can see St. Paul's Cathedral here. You can see the Royal Exchange up there. It was a terrible, terrible event. Six days after the fire were out, people were already designing the new London. Christopher Wren, you might have heard of him. He had something to do with the, the uh, dome at St. Paul's Cathedral. He also designed that monument with the gold ball on top uh, that commemorated the fire. So he was a great architect. Six days after the fire, he submitted to the king a plan to rebuild London. And this was his plan. This was his design. And you can see there's a certain symmetry. There's a certain flow in this. And it looks nice, the, the angles of the street. You can see the St. Paul's down here. You can see the Royal Exchange up here. And, and a very nice, it looks very nice. How would you judge this design? I don't know. I'm, I'm not good at judging city layouts, so I'm not sure. Here's another design. This is by John Evelyn. Uh, he wanted to create the most noble city that can be. He wanted to rebuild London from the ashes. And he, a lot of angled lines, a lot like uh, Christopher Wren's, but a little simpler, a little more symmetric. I like symmetric. That looks cool. Here's a design by Robert Hooke. Robert went in for the square. I think this tells a lot about the uh, artistic flair of the individual architects, kind of how they put things together. So he has a very square-shaped, very grid-oriented uh, architecture here for the city. 
Here's one by Valentine Knight. He had seven or eight north-south roads with lots of lots of lots of little tiny lanes running east and west. So he'd get a lot of houses built in. Because he was very concerned about the people being able to, to provide housing for all the people that, who, were, who lost their homes. However, he made the suggestion that they should use fines and taxes to raise the money to rebuild London. And Charles II, the king at the time, had Knight arrested for suggesting that he would try to profit from so public a calamity of his people. Where are those kinds of politicians today? <laughs> Finally, we have uh, Richard Newcourt's design. And uh, you can barely see it here, but here, right here, is the original wall. Now, the interesting fact about this design is that not only is he rebuilding the part that burned down, he wants to tear down the remaining good parts and rebuild them from scratch as well. <laughs> Needless to say, this design didn't go over very well. But here we have five designs, all submitted within weeks of the burning of London. And the, the burning question now, the, the burning question, the question now <laughs> is which of these designs did they choose to go with? None. Yeah, absolutely. None of them. Um, they did not choose any of them. They decided, actually, they didn't decide. So they rebuilt the city incrementally from scratch as they needed. As they got to a park, they just rebuilt it as it went. No upfront design and incremental builds. That sounds like maybe this was the first Agile project. <laughs> OK, so now, Agile. I was introduced to Agile by Bob Martin. Who, who here has heard of Robert Martin? Very good, excellent. Who has read his book? Good, so, so you know the, the five principles of solid design, yes? Yes, you know them? You wanna teach this? <laughs> oh, he's thinking about it. <laughs> he's seriously considering it. Right, right. In, in the, the late 90s, early 2000s, Bob Martin sat down and said, we need some principles for design. So that when we look at a design, we have some more or less objective ways of judging good designs from bad designs. It's not just this artistic feel-good thing, you know, it's got lots of angles, or no, it's got lots of squares. It's, it's more objective. So he sat down and actually thought this out and gathered up five principles. They're not all original with him, but he kind of put them together in a package. And these are the five here, and if you take the first initials, you get S-O-L-I-D for solid, therefore, the solid design principles. So, what are the solid design principles? You can read about them here at this link. He goes into great depth about them. I bumped the mic with my hand when I put it in the pocket. There we go. Now we're back. I don't know what happened. But the solid design principles are all about dependencies. Because that was Bob's big concern at the time. How to build maintainable code. And you do that by managing your dependencies. Now why are dependencies important? <coughs> Suppose you have two classes, like a car and an engine. And your car object uses the engine object. But the engine object doesn't know anything about a car. It just does its job. The car uses the engine. So there is a dependency that goes from a car object to an engine object, and we denote that in UML-like diagrams by an arrow, right? So arrows in UML always point in the direction of a dependency. So this is a using kind of dependency here. There's also a dependency, okay. This arrow means that car objects are allowed to call methods on engine objects. Engine object will not call anything on a car because it doesn't know about a car. There's also an inheritance type of dependency that's also an arrow but a different style of arrow. But it is also a dependency that the car object depends, since it inherits from vehicle, it depends upon vehicle existing. So this is another kind of dependency, again, denoted by an arrow. Okay, so why are they important? If I were to change module X on this diagram, change the interface, change the semantics of one of the methods in module X, who was affected? Absolutely everybody. So dependency tells you 
how changes propagate through your system. If I change X, then A, B, C, D, and E are all affected by that change. So I have a great deal of pressure upon me to not change X or to choose X so it is a type of module that is, does not tend to change. How about this diagram? If I change Z in this diagram, who is affected? Z alone, because nobody else cares about what happens to Z. Z uses everybody else. What if I change module C? Who is affected? Z is affected. So in this diagram, we have isolated the propagation of changes. So if C changes, Z might be affected, and we have two modules we might have to look at. But everybody else is probably OK, because there's no direct dependency on those. How about this one? What if I change module L? Who's affected? Well, definitely K is affected, because K has a direct reference to L. Possibly, maybe, J is affected, because if K changes, we might force some changes back here. So there is a kind of a transitive property to dependency as well. So, so this is the basis for the solid principles. Bob looked at these kinds of ideas and said, OK, how can we manage dependencies in software? Now, in the late 90s and the early part of this millennium, um, Bob was mainly concerned about Java and C++ programming. So he was mainly dealing with static, statically typed languages. Now, we know that statically typed languages have stronger dependencies than a dynamically typed language like Ruby. So it makes you wonder, these solid principles do we just throw them out the window when we're dealing with Ruby? Since Ruby's dynamically typed, do they, do they apply at all? And this is the purpose of this talk. I want to kind of get down into some of these questions and look at each of these principles and see how they apply to a dynamic language like Ruby. So let's just start with the first principle. Single responsibility principle says that a class should have one and only one reason to change. And here's a good example of this. In the Rake uh, project that I maintain, there is a module called the, the application. And it, this is the top level object that kind of sits and starts up when Rake starts up. And it goes and it parses all the command line arguments and then also um, reads the Rake files and, and defines the task and holds those tasks in a hash. So it actually has two jobs. So it has two reasons to change. Number one, if we change the way the command lines are, are handled, it needs to change. Number two, if we change the way that we store tasks, it needs to change. So the single responsibility principle says we should probably break up these two reasons to change into two separate modules. Maybe, maybe perhaps something like this. We have an application object, and he uses a task manager. And the task manager manages the storage of all the tasks and keeps track of them. And the application then is just dealing with command line arguments. Now, there's actually a good advantage to doing this because once I've broken the task manager off into a separate object, I can create nested structures of task managers to handle named scopes in Rake. And although Rake doesn't do it that way right now, this might be a good way of handling that. And I might want to change Rake in the future to do this. So splitting things up gives you a lot more flexibility in the way you build your code. Even in a dynamic language, single responsibility principle is an important principle to follow, I feel. And any disagreement? <laughs> you guys are an easy crowd. <laughs> an easy way to tell if you're violating the single responsibility principle is to write down the purpose of that module. And you have to, if you have to use the word and or the word or in the description of your task, then it's probably doing two things. So that's a nice, easy rule to follow. I love these slides. OK. Open close principle is, was first thought up by Bertrand Meyer, who designed the Eiffel language. And he says that modules should be, you should be able to extend a class's behavior without modifying. It should be open for modification, but closed for change. Did I say that right? Open for change, 
Open for extension, closed for mod modification. Thank you, yes. Um, which sounds weird. What, do, what in the world does that mean? Suppose you, someone wrote a really cool library that was really useful, and a lot of people use it. And you are writing an application now, and you would also like to use this really cool library. But there's a problem. Because you see, this really cool library works 90%. But there's 10% of things that it doesn't do that you would like to have it do. So you need to change it to work for you. Well, the typical way we do this in software is called um, copy and paste. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a valid design technique, so I've been told. <laughs> and then you have a modified version of that cool library. And unfortunately, any bug fixes applied up here will not be applied to your modified version, so you, learn, you lose all that kind of advantage. What is a better way of doing this? Fork it on GitHub. Fork it on GitHub. <laughs> Fork the modern copy-paste. <laughs> Hire someone to, fix, to, to back, uh, fill all the bugs, yes. A better way is to subclass the one change the, the behavior you need in your subclass, and then your application can use the subclass version that you have somewhat of a control over, and yet the original one is still there, and any fixes that go into that will be picked up by yours automatically. Okay, now, now there's an extra dependency here, and that's fine. I mean, we, we, you can't write software without dependencies, but, but you, you gain that, you gain great benefit by doing it this way. Okay, but, you say, Ruby has open classes. So let, yeah, 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 so let's just monkey patch it. Think about that one. Here's, um, this is a real, a simulated real life example. This is not the real code, but this is very, very, very similar to something that happened in real life to a rather outspoken former member of the Ruby community who could kill you with his thumbs. <laughs> I think you know who I mean. Um, here's a logger. And the interesting thing about this logger is it provides a way of changing the format string. So you have a way of going into the logger, and you have some control over the, the format. Not a great deal of control, but a little bit of control by specifying a format string. And we're going to do that um, in our application. Yeah, here we go. So we set the log string here, so we see log colon in our log string, and it comes out down here. And we can see that, and we run it. Now we include that really cool library. And we run our program again, and whoops, what's happened here? Our log colon message is gone, it's disappeared. And what they've done is gone into the cool library, has opened up the class, and replace the format command, because they needed some more explicit control over the formatting. Well, they went in and clobbered software that your code depends upon and has broken your code. So um, rather than the principle of least surprise, our infamous former Ruby community member called this the principle of most heinous arsenic injection. So is there a better way? Yes. <sighs> Derive your cool logger from the simple logger, implement the behavior one, then in your cool library, you can use your subclass one, and you won't affect anybody else using the original logger at all. This is a better way, better way to design it. So open close principle, still important in Ruby. Prefer to subclass rather than opening a class and, and uh, modifying it. Now this one begins to get interesting, the dependency inversion principle. And uh, I, lo I love this, would you solder directly into a socket? I, I, you know, it scares me, but I know some people who would. <laughs> it says depend upon abstractions and not concretions. I love the word concretion. Is that a word? It is now, because I said it is. Um, I like to mess around with hardware. Did anyone see the blimp demo in here the other day? Okay, this is my Arduino project. Not nearly as impressive. It just uh, is a Pomodoro timer that raises a flag when you start your 25 minutes, and then at the end of 25 minutes, it will uh, lower the flag. Um, 
Yeah, the blimp's more impressive, but this is fun. <laughs> the reason I introduce this is because my next example is going to be a hardware-based example. Uh, and I actually use this in telephone interviews. I ask people to do a design problem over the phone. It's a very simple problem. It's to design an embedded hardware system, software for an embedded thermostat that controls a furnace. So you have thermostat software, and you have a furnace software, and you might do something like this. You can turn the furnace on, and you can turn it off. So it has on and off methods, and the thermostat calls that. Now remember, Solid was written with Java in mind, so let's just look at the Java solution here to kind of motivate where it comes from. Uh, here's your furnace class. It's got an on method and an off method. And then the thermostat, here's the run thing, and if the furnace should be on, you turn it on, if otherwise you turn it off. Really simple control module here. Um, anything interesting about this code? Yeah, yeah. Look, we reference furnace explicitly in this code. We are hard coded to use a furnace object. That means this thermostat can never run any other bit of hardware other than that particular furnace. What we want to do instead is to introduce an interface between the two. And we'll call this an on-off device. Now, the thermostat uses the on-off device, which is just interface. And if you're not familiar with Java, interfaces are just method signatures with no implementation with them. Okay? And then Furnace implements on and off, and it inherits from the on-off device. So here's your inheritance dependency, here's your using dependency. And notice that the original one had all your dependencies going this direction. And the new code has dependencies going the other direction. This way. Don't, yeah, turn towards the audience when I say that. This way. Therefore, dependency inversion, we're changing the direction of the dependencies. Now, the nice thing about this is now we have this interface. This is what an interface looks like in Java. And our thermostat code has removed all references from the furnace object. We now reference this on-off device, which is an abstract interface. It's not a particular device. And the advantage of that is now we can implement all kinds of objects that conform to the on-off device interface. And our thermostat can control them as well. Well, that's really nice. I like that. So, Java people have it ingrained in their heads to code to interfaces. And I'm sure that the Java people who saw that original code say, ah, no interface, right? Okay, so this is like ingrained in their minds. So, what does Ruby look like? Here's the furnace code, very similar to the Java version. And here is the thermostat code before I changed it to conform to the dependency inversion principle. Now watch very carefully. The next slide will be this code <laughs> after I've applied the dependency inversion principle. You ready? <laughs> There's no explicit references to Furnace in this to begin with, so kind of the whole dependency inversion thing falls off automatically. So we begin to wonder, does, does that mean that dependency inversion is not important in Ruby, that we can just ignore it? Well, you think about that, I've got a rant to do. Uh, some people feel that they must check the type of an object passed in in order to be type safe. And so they will embed is a test throughout their code and throw exceptions unless that object is the proper type. Notice what we've done. We're back in Java mode thinking, because now we have an explicit hard-coded reference to Furnace. And this code will no longer work with arbitrary on-off devices. In Ruby, you have to work extra hard to do what Java does normally. <laughs> Keep that in mind. OK. so. What do we put here in our diagram for Ruby? Well, Ruby doesn't have explicit interfaces, but it has something conceptually very similar. I like to call them protocols. Now, protocols are not coded. There is no, nothing in, if you, if you go into GitHub and you look throughout a code base, you will not find a file that has the protocol in it. But that doesn't mean we don't use it, right? So 
thermostat is written with this idea of something I can turn off and something I can turn on. And then we write the code here that conforms to that idea, that protocol. So a protocol is just a list of methods with certain semantics. Certain semantics. Keep that in your mind, too, because we'll get to that in a little bit. OK, so protocols are important in Ruby. Um, so the guy who wrote that, uh, that, that uh, is a test now, he said, oh, OK, protocols are the important thing. Let's, uh, let's do this. Let's check for the protocol. <sighs> OK, we no longer have an explicit reference to furnace. But I'm not sure what value this brings to the table. And in fact, a, a friend of mine has suggested that instead of duck typing, this should be called chicken typing. Because <laughs> you're just scared to use the uh, facilities Ruby's, Ruby gives you. OK, uh, example, XML Builder is a library I wrote. It generates um, XML um, very easily. And it writes the XML to a target object. So here is an example usage of XML Builder. You give it a target, and here I'm giving it a string. So it's going to build the XML into the string. And this uh, creates a person um, nested with a name nested inside of that with a value for that name. So it builds up a nested XML. It's a really nice library. And we print that out here. And it all works because the target here is explicitly defined to take a shovel operator. So let's go back and look at this. So this is the target. I've got to give it an object. What kind of objects can I give it? The documentation says anything that responds to the shovel operator and takes a string and returns itself. So a method with a signature with semantics. That's a protocol. So I've explicitly called out the protocol in the documentation for XML Builder. That means I can go and I can give it say, a file, because files in Ruby respond to the shovel operator. So XML Builder can write into a string, or it can write into a file, or it can even write into an array, if there's some reason you want to do that, or it can write into any object that supports the shovel protocol, which is kind of a standard protocol in Ruby anyway. So that's easy to define. OK, so code to protocols. This is our uh, mantra in Ruby. Rather than code to interfaces, code to protocols. And think about protocols when you're designing your system. Protocols are important. Barbara Liskoff just won, she, she just won an award at uh, Uppsala, right? Did, I don't remember what that was. Does anybody know? Turing the Turing Award. She got the Turing Award and gave a speech at Uppsala here, just like within the last month or so. Barbara Liskoff, a number of years ago, came up with what's called the Liskoff substitution <laughs> principle. And uh, I'm not going to read that for you. Um, it's very mathematical, very precise, very academic. But essentially what it says is that derived classes should be substitutable for their base classes. This is a very Java-like formulation. This is what Bob Martin says. Uh, personally, I kind of like this definition of the substitution principle. Dave Thomas just calls it duck typing. If it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, then treat it like a duck, and you'll be good. OK, so when is something substitutable? When can I take one object and substitute it for another and expect my code to work? This is a very important question. And I think it goes to the roots of the power that object-oriented design gives to you. And so it's very important to understand substitutability in an OO design. I'm going to start with this example here. Suppose we have a module called normal math, as opposed to abnormal math. And it has a function called square root in it. And this algorithm here, I don't know if you recognize it or not, this is uh, Newton's iteration, a fixed point iteration for approximating a square root. And it stays in this loop until the answer, your, your answer here, is within three decimal places of the correct value of square root. So this is a very interesting piece of code. We can uh, write another version of this. We'll put it in a module called Accurate Math. And it does exactly the same thing, except its termination is uh, 
five decimal places. So it is more accurate, is the answer you get back should be, well, is guaranteed to be more accurate than the guarantee of the previous one. We also got a module called sloppy math that does the same thing, but it's, you know, yeah, if we're close, that's good enough for government work. Should have called this government math. So now we can ask two questions about the square root method. What does the square root require before you can call it? And what does the square root method promise you after it is finished and it returns? Require and promise. Think of those things. Okay. So the square root requires that your input be non-negative. It must be greater than or equal to zero. Because if it were less than zero, you'd get a complex number back. And we're not going to handle that, which is okay. It promises that the answer you return is going to be within three decimal places of the correct square root value. So you got a requirement and you got a promise, two things. This is called the contract for this method. Anyone worked with any design by contract? Okay, a few of you, a few of you. This comes right from Bertrand Meyer, right from the language Eiffel, which I absolutely love. Um, I think it's good to learn Eiffel for this reason. Uh, truthfully, though, I wrote more Ruby code in six months than I did in three years of using Eiffel. So take that in mind. But, but, but the disciplines, the things you learn in learning Eiffel is well worth it. Okay, so you ask the question, what does it require? What does it promise? Now here's some client code. We are using the square root here, and this is how we'd use it. You pass in the math object, you call square root on it, and you're finding the distance between point A and point B. Now, there's actually two views of the contract. There is the view from square root's point of view, what I'll call the actual contract, and that is what is actually being provided by that module. There's the expected contract over here, and that is what the client expects. Now, if the expected contract, its requirements and promises, match exactly to the actual contract, then everybody's happy. It works. Software will work. Boy, that's a bold statement. How about if we made a better promise? What, uh, what if, instead of saying three decimal places, the actual contract says five decimal places. If I substituted accurate math in for normal math and the client used it, would this software still work? Most likely, yes, because the promise is better. It's like you make a contract with uh, someone to mow your yard, and the requirement is they mow it once a week and they do it twice a week. Hey, that's all the better, right? It's a better promise. It's a better delivery than what you expected. So that's OK. But what if we go the other way? What if the promise is weaker than what's expected? We're expecting three decimal points of accuracy, and we're only getting one decimal point of accuracy. Will this work? Maybe. You don't know. You don't know. So because the contract is broken at this point. So weaker promises, worse promises, are what make objects non-substitutable. So accurate math is substitutable for normal math. But sloppy math is not substitutable for normal math. So now we've got some rules and substitutability. We're beginning to understand that. Yes, in the back. Better promise might fail also. Like what if you're comparing for them to be equal and they're not equal because you're more precise, right? In other words, the, the gardener is using twice as much gas and that that's a problem. Um, quite possibly, although, yeah. Um, you may also have a performance implication in the contract as well. If you're more accurate, it takes longer to do. There, yeah, there, the, 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 there may be a performance aspect involved in that. And if the performance aspect is important, you should probably make it part of the contract. And that way you can evaluate whether it's substitutable or not. Yeah. OK. Yeah, and, and good point there. OK, so now let's, uh, let's look at this. This is complex square root. And it uh, makes no assumptions about x, because we explicitly check for it. And if it's going to be less than 0, we will return a complex answer rather than just the regular real answer. So the contract for this guy, oh, same, same accuracy guarantee. 
The contract for this guy says in the requirements, anything goes. This is a looser requirement because it accepts a wider range of inputs. Now, is complex math substitutable for normal math? Yes, because, normal ma uh, because the client will always pass in a value that is greater than or equal to zero. He will never explore the area where the number is negative. So yes, you can substitute in con uh, complex math, and a less restrictive requirement is OK. If it is a preconditioned, the requirements of the precondition are on the client. If the client does not match the precondition, there is no requirement on the supplier software to do anything. If the client expects an exception, it's got to be part of the requirement. It's got to be part of the contract. So, and, and we, can go, we can go into deep discussion about that. Uh, so I kind of want to... Not, if you want to talk to me afterwards, I'd love to talk to you on that one, because that gets in the whole way you design exceptions. And my take on exceptions is just a little bit different than a lot of people, so I'd love to talk to you on that one. But yes, yes, if, if you have a precondition that says, you cannot pass me a negative one, and I pass you a negative one, then I might throw an exception, or I might not. But if you expect me to throw an exception, then that is part of the expected contract. Okay. I promise. That would, be, that would be the promise, yeah. I promise to throw an exception. OK. If I actually wrote a square root module that required n to be greater than 0, this is a more restrictive requirement. This would also fail because I might pass in a 0 from the client, in which case, who knows what happens. We're breaking the precondition. So more restrictive requirements not allowed. So, the answer to the question, the, the reason we went into all of this was to decide when can I substitute one object for another object, okay? And we can summarize these rules very simply. Require no more, promise no less. So the contract I'm providing has to require no more than the contract you're expecting and promise no less than the contract you're expecting. If you follow these rules, this is the definition of duct typing. If an object follows these contract rules, then it is a duct type and can be substituted. So I really like this. We've now got a formal definition for what it means to duct type. I think that's a very powerful idea. How are we doing on time? I've got two more principles. Can I make it? <laughs> it's a break. Keep going. We're getting close, OK. Um, we'll go through this fast. OK, make fine-grained interfaces that are client-specific is this rule. Here's a hardware piece of hardware that has a keyboard and a displayer uh, connected. You can actually buy this one. This is called the wild card keyboard and display. So if I were to write this in software, I might write a module that looks like this, and an interface that looks like this, and software that uses it like this. What's wrong? Remember the rule that you want to depend upon things that tend not to change. Here, this display menu is depending upon an interface that has keyboard and display methods in it. So if the keyboard changes, that may impact your display menu. This is not a good thing. So the interface segregation principle says segregate your interfaces and do separate ones. So the display menu display depends upon only display things. And the get selection method only depends upon keyboard things, and your dependencies are much nicer. So, so this is a better design. This is all ISP says. Uh, the other nice thing about this is that you can, uh, OK, OK, why? why? Okay. Um, you have fewer reasons to change, and um, easier to implement alternatives. So if I get new hardware that has a separate keyboard and a separate display, I can implement them like this, and it's easier to implement. I don't have to implement display things in this keyboard that doesn't have a display, right? So, so that's good. But again, in Ruby, we don't deal with interfaces. We've got these protocols. 
So the Ruby formulation of this is really quite simple. It says clients should depend upon as narrow a protocol as you can get away with. Okay, you can see that in the builder. Builder only uses the shovel operator to put things into the target. So anything that implements shovel, that's good enough. Suppose you have an array that you're using as a stack. I would suggest sticking to push and pop operations on that array and not general purpose array operations, allowing you more flexibility in substituting objects in there. So depend upon narrow protocols is the Ruby version of this principle. Okay. Oh, I got through all five. I only had one left instead of two. Um, I got five. I got four minutes. Now, instead of questions from the audience, I'm going to ask you questions. For discussion, Active Record implements a domain concept and a persistence concept in one object. Does this violate the single responsibility principle? Discuss. Yes, it does. <laughs> Absolutely. Does it bother us? Yes. Okay, yes, it does. Okay. Why? I'm curious. Uh, well, once you start building larger applications, your domain objects uh, actually start to encompass a very large number of persistence objects. Mm -hmm. uh, Yeah. So as designs become more complex, the interactions between all these different interfaces become more complex, and it is less convenient to do that. Good point. Anyone, anyone else have feedback on this? Yes? It makes it harder to test. Makes it harder to test? Yes. Yes, it does. Especially if you want to segregate database-related tests from just business logic tests. And since they're going against the same object, it's inconvenient. It makes your persistence object much heavier, which actually causes a lot of Okay, okay. Uh, so we heard from three people who are kind of negative on this. How about, is anybody okay with this? You're okay with it. You want to, you want to defend your position? You can move the, 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 the domain layer to other, other place. I mean, uh, active record maybe is not a, 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 a partner, uh, some kind of religious pattern, but it's good. I, I don't know what I mean, but. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the key, the key to these design principles, they, they are just principles. They are not ironclad rules that you must follow under all conditions. But they give you objective reasons for discussing designs. And you can say, I don't like this design because it kind of violates single responsibility principle. Or you got kind of a dependency inversion problem over here. You know, you can, you can talk about these things. Um, okay, this is, this is in with regard to contracts. If you decide you're going to write contracts for your methods, or at least think about them, uh, sometimes you can't express them as logical um, conditions. What should you do about that? Rethink your requirements. Rethink your requirements, okay. Write tests. Write tests, okay, that's good. It, it's really interesting. Post conditions in particular, post conditions and unit tests are very, very important. I just lost the time again, didn't I? Testing, testing, testing. Testing, there we go. Um, I've I think it's a cable problem. There we go. It's a dependency <laughs> injection problem. You, I'll try this again. I'll hold this, okay? So I'm not touching the cord. Post conditions and unit tests are very similar. They do the same thing. However, they do them differently. Unit tests give specific, very understandable examples, but it's a finite number of examples. Post conditions state the truth for all possible invocations of that method. So it turns out that a lot of times post conditions are harder to write than unit tests. But because they are more general, sometimes they provide more, more value. So, so that's an interesting point. Yeah, so yes. The harder to write, not, the harder not to, not to repeat implementation. To be, to be orthogonal. Sometimes they're harder to not implement. Yeah, in fact, sometimes for, for, simple, for simple methods, um, the post condition is essentially the body of the code as well. So yeah, you're just restating what the implementation does. Yes? 
Okay. Um, just a couple more questions. I'm going to go through these real quick because we're out of time, but I want you to think about these. How do you verify that your client software only uses a narrow protocol on the objects that you're using? How, if you only want to use push and pop, how do you make sure your software doesn't use anything else? Think about that one. Um, solid principles. We're written with static languages in mind. Are there principles that might apply to a dynamic language like Ruby that do not apply to a static language like Java. Think about that one. I think if you have any answer to this one, I'd love to have a discussion with you afterwards, because I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. OK, so summary. I think the solid principles are important. They don't map exactly, but there's a lot of good information in them that we can apply to our Ruby designs. OK, thank you. <laughs>